The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello and welcome to this week's Crashing Glass Podcast. I'm your host, Holly Hurley, and with me as always is my co-host, Jill Henley. Hi, you, Jill. Hi, Holly. And Jill and I are, I guess, indulging uh, something that we enjoy very much. We're going to talk about running again this week. And uh, this week joining us is a lady by the name of Robin Benoit. She's a two-time marathoner and uh, was a college athlete actually on Jill's college uh, track team. So uh, she has a long history with the sport. And we're going to have a chance to talk shop today. So welcome, Robin. Well, thank you. So, girls, um, you know, I think this is a really good time to talk about this, especially because I think women are getting into running in greater numbers these days. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting, cool topic, Um, Holly, as I was telling you earlier today when we talked about, you know, our our podcast and I was thinking that there's a little mini boom going on. You know, the original running boom was like, early 70s, you know, like Bill Rogers, Frank Shorter, um, you know, they've started winning marathon, big marathons, and so they've got some interest uh, in running in our country, and, but now there's like, I feel like a, a re, re-boom <laughs> that's been going on, and it involves women in great numbers, and I've been noticing it on a small scale just in my town and with people I know, but I think it is on a big scale across the country, especially, you know, thinking about the couch to 5k programs that, you know, we hear out there and getting people off the couch and getting them training for, you know, 5k and just setting that goal. So I want to throw it back to you guys to see what you thought that there was um, a lot more interest for women in running. Well, I'd especially be interested to hear what Robin has to say about this because Robin, you ran distance in college, correct? Yes. So tell me a little bit about, you know, the Couch to 5K movement. Obviously, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Couch to 5K trains people who have, um, it can be set up for people who've never run before. And they can start running like a minute, walking two minutes, and then you build up slowly to where you walk less, run more, and eventually do a 5K. Um, And, you know, Robin, is that sort of how you started your running career, or, or do you think that's a good method? Well, no, I mean, I started running in high school as part of my high school cross country team and kind of continue that into college and after. But I think it's a it is a good way to get people moving and getting them into running. And I feel like I'm seeing more people out on the streets just as I'm driving around or running past my house Um, and just in people that I encounter, like people I work with you know, starting a running program, maybe they haven't been runners before. It wasn't like they ran in high school and then got away from it. But are kind of coming to running as, you know, as they're getting older and moving into their 30s and 40s and and um, and kind of setting that goal of running a 5K as, a, as an easy way to start. So. Yeah. And you know, some of them, and well, they just, I think it's amazing that it's like the 5K is only the beginning because then they, uh, again, I'm speaking about this like from anecdotal from like the people I know in my town and see who I'm seeing much many more people running especially women but also you know from the some of the stats that I've read uh, are nationwide that not only do they get off the couch and run a 5k but then they say well I'm going to run a five mile next time or I'm going to train for you know run I'm going to try to run seven that's my longest ever and then nine and then the next thing you know they're training for a half marathon and I see this repeated over and over over these last, you know, five to ten years, it's it's astounding that there's just so much, so many women that are turning into they're recreational runners, but they're 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 setting their goals on road races. Well, and and Jill, you actually shared with us a Running Times article. I mean, this is sort of a big story right now uh, that the races are getting. I believe the the statistics that you sent were larger and slower. So almost, I mean, as you called it a mini running boom, it seems that almost everyone's kind of coming to running right now. Yeah, it, I guess the, the numbers, from what I read, the numbers began to change in the early 90s when those running boomers, you know, who kind of started when they were younger, they, they were now masters runners, you know, in the masters categories in the races. And by the year 2000, 44% of marathon finishers were over 40. So that's almost half of people finishing a marathon were over 40 years old. So it definitely was that 
older group that was that you know getting into that running boom and and staying with it throughout their adult lives and then the women's division the growth was even more dramatic so in 1980 only 10 percent of marathon finishers were female so it was 10 percent in 1980 and that figure now in two, it, this this is from 2010 so just but pretty recent it's now 40 percent 40 percent of marathon finishers are women and they, they make up more than half the finishers at other races, shorter races like half marathons, 5Ks, 10Ks, etc. So that is a huge jump in 30 years from 1980 to, you know, 2010. It's very impressive. Well, you know, Joel, that makes me think a lot about the, you actually mentioned the 90s being a big part of the boom. And, you know, 96 was when Boston, actually, the Boston Marathon set the, mm-hmm. set the record as the world's largest marathon. They had 38,708 entrants. Uh, they ended up having 36,748 starters and 35,868 finishers. And wow. I think it's, uh, yeah, right? Like, that just blows your mind. And they started in 1897 with 18 participants. <laughs> I know. Oh, that were I'm sure they were all men, of course. They were all right? Men. Oh, yeah. No, women couldn't. Uh, there was uh, actually, uh, if we could talk to the lobster about this when we did the special on BaseNet, Larry was talking about the first woman to ever run Boston. And uh, and my husband and I have actually had some conversations about it. I believe it was in the late 70s. And she had qualified, you know, with what was considered a, a male time. She had qualified right. just fair and square. And she was at the starting line, and the officials realized she was a woman and came to try to stop her. And in order to let her finish the race, the other men, also elite athletes, actually pushed aside all of the race officials and, and would not allow them to get to her. They, they basically surrounded her and said, we're going to make sure you finish this race. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, wow, that's really cool. Robin, do you have any, do you, um, you remember the details about that, the, the first woman in the Boston and... I, I remember hearing something about it, but I didn't know the details of the story. So, yeah. Well, what would it, what I was going to ask you is that what do you think about the, you know, sort of that those those numbers jumping up in road racing and and I don't know and you know you you came out of college and, and just kind of kept going, you know, kept running. But I didn't know if you had. I wanted to kind of hear what you had to add to that sort of like that big that 30 year jump that went from you know 10 percent of marathon finishers all the way up to 40 percent. Well, I think, you know, there's a piece of that that just has to do with girls and women's sports in general and the amount of participants as women who are now, you know, running in their 30s and 40s that were lifelong athletes as children, where you right. may not have had that in earlier generations. Do you think, um, and do you think Robin, it kind of connects to Title IX also? Like, well, I mean, absolutely. I think it, it's you, you just, you have that competitive piece. So So now you have, you know, women who have grown up as, competitors in various sports their whole life that they don't want to just be a recreational runner in the sense that they want to go out and and jog to stay in shape they also want that competitive piece of it i, I think that that's a piece piece as they as they age and, and get older because they they've been doing competitive sports since they were eight years old or ten yeah, years old or younger in most cases you know, yeah now. well now it's now it's yeah three yeah <laughs> so <laughs> I, you know i think that there's a there's a piece of of that too. And I also think that there's, you know, there is that piece of there are a lot more programs out there for people to get into running, whether they're through raising funds for a charity that kind of connect you with coaches and a group to participate with and help you set that goal of, you know, fishing, um, whatever race it happens to be. Another thing that Boston, that the Boston Marathon and the Jimmy Fund and Dana Farber were totally on the forefront of there in Boston. They were sort of the genesis of that movement they were the first place that said hey we could use this big race to make money right and it's been a very successful movement for many many charities i think ever since then but do you think maybe also just in general not just with women running but also with with the big boom in general because i mean obviously this crosses gender lines do you think some of it has to do with the technology out there to make it so easy to run to find your you know with gps and with nike plus you know you can literally just leave it used to be you have to i remember getting frustrated running because I would have to plan a route. And even in the early days of Google Maps, the best you could do is like try to map it out before you went and remember what turns to take. And nowadays you basically just turn your watch on, leave the house and then come back. I mean, I guess that started with Timex being able to time yourself, but I wonder how much of this movement is connected to technology. I mean, I don't know. Well, it's RunFinder, right? Is that what people use? 
Uh, um, some, some people use, what is it, map, map my run. Some people use run finder. So Jill, you were, you were saying with uh, some of the technology is you, you've heard of run finder. I, I think I used map my run.com, Google maps. Uh, you know, back in the day, we really, you had to be resourceful. And I mean, that was even what I'm talking about is even after there were computers. I mean, imagine if you were in the age where all you had was your Timex watch and a map. Or, well, that's, that's or, all I, that's all yeah. I still, <laughs> but I, I mean, I just use my watch and I run on, usually run on time because I know what my pace per mile is and I know I just run kind of know where I want to go. So I'm very, I'm very old school and very kind of, you know, I, I don't map it out. Like I, I know generally where I want to go when I run, but I don't necessarily have it all mapped out, but that's part of the fun for me. Um, I don't want to map it out. I, I think Robert and I can both say that we've, we've done so many workouts and long runs and, and all the different types of training that now it's sort of, it's, it, it, you kind of, sometimes you just need to shut it off, you know, shut off and just go running <laughs> right. and not map it. But I think that the new runners, the nouveau runners, our, our technology plays a huge part because they are mapping it out ahead of time because that gets them to complete, that, that gets them through the whole course, you know, because they're, they say, okay, I'm running this loop. It's, I've mapped it out. It's four miles and I'm going to finish it. And, and knowing it ahead of time is important. For their, you know, for their training, for that the mental toughness and and to get through the run, especially if they're adding more mileage. And and uh, there's a group in just in my neighborhood who they meet. Um, there's I guess they meet now on Fridays, and I ran with them last week for the first time. And they all use run. They, most of them use Run Finder, which gets posted on Facebook automatically. Right. I think unless you shut it off. So they will like map out their runs. And then log their runs in, and it automatically gets posted to their Facebook page how far they ran that day. And you can look up the route that they did and the exact mileage and their exact time. So, and there's this group, though, that now there's all actually several groups in town that meet and run. But this one group was right in my neighborhood, and there's there are 10 to 12 women, not that, you know, not that make it every week, but that have a kind of a... They're a group, and they enter road races together. I mean, I, I find it fascinating because it really has become, it's a social, it's social and fitness combined. Well, and, and Robin, do you think, what do you think about that sort of, is it, a, does it help with accountability to post your runs online, or does it make you less, make you want to, or does it make you shyer about running? Like, I, I, I don't know, do you think that's a helpful tool? I think it, I think it really depends on your perspective. I, I think for a lot of people, it probably does help with accountability because you put it out there and so that you know that you need to show up, you know, that you're, you've got to be working hard. So I, I can completely get that, particularly if you're goal setting towards a particular race, you know, I, I kind of feel both ways about it because I'd also be really embarrassed if my time was slow, but that's just, you know, <laughs> me feeling competitive, <laughs> but, right. um, but that just kind of that piece that you're putting it out there that I did this today, I, I do think absolutely helps with accountability. I know for me, there was always accountability in having to meet somebody else to run because it was easy to, you know, find a million other things to do if it was only me. Um, but if I had to meet Jill, for instance, you know, I wasn't going to let Jill down, you know, to not show up. So I think yeah. accountability plays a big role in that way. So whatever yeah. gets you there. <laughs> so. Right. No, that I think that's and I think that's why these groups have formed and, and people do, you know, they do, they have, they, they plan to meet each other and they don't want to let the other ones down and, and they get their run in and they're so happy to have done it, you know, and to afterwards. So it's such a cool, it's so neat because it running is, is a, you know, that runner mentality is, it, it can be, a, you know, it, it's a very individual sport. It's a very mental, <laughs> mental sport where you it's mind over matter a lot when you're in a race right and and I think it's so neat that it's catching and that you know and not everybody's gonna get out there and push themselves to the edge and get to hit the wall and every time they do a race and you know some people take it very casually but what whatever works I mean they, they're getting that endorphin they're getting that kick of endor endorphins and it it becomes addictive wouldn't you say Holly <laughs> Oh yes, I'm, I'm I'm a definite addict, and I don't know if you girls have experienced this, and I'd love to hear from our listeners if they've experienced some of this as well. My running partner and I, well, first of all, on an emotional level, you really get to a place where sort of nothing becomes off limits. You know, you it becomes sort of your your confidant. So right. on an emotional level, like you get to where if you, for us at least, I know if you have that team running mentality, 
you get to where there is a sort of trust that develops. It's not to say like what's on the run stays on the run, but I think maybe because you're physically exerting, your filter doesn't work as well. You know, like your, your <laughs> energies are focused elsewhere. And I also find, and I don't know about you girls, but as far as being addicted is concerned, uh, digestion works better. Like sometimes if I'm having trouble digesting, if I feel like something's sort of stuck or not working right, you go for a run, everything feels better. And I find my running partners and I talk about that quite a bit, which I think is hilarious and sort of guy-like almost, you know? It's kind of, of what do you say? Guy-like or Guy-like. <laughs> like my husband's always like, gross, I don't want to hear it, you know, but my running partner and I can talk about that and be like, oh, you know, so glad to get this in because... Yeah. And I think also mentally it helps, I mean, you know, there's a lot of research on that mentally it helps, you know, flow blood, get oxygen to your brain, make you think better. If I don't run the week that I have a big test, I don't know. I mean, I'm just not performing like I would. So as far as like, yeah, people talk about the runner side, but there are also like just some basic long lasting benefits for like, is it like that for you guys? If like you don't run for two weeks, everything kind of shuts down? Um, yes. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not running, I'm not running a lot of mileage right now, but I do, if I don't run at all for, let's say a week and a half to two weeks, and then I, and I'll be driving somewhere and I'll see someone running and I'll start, I'll feel that pull like, oh, I got to get out there. (laughs) But to talk about that, I like how you, you know, you sort of talked about that nothing's off limits. I think that when you have a regular running partner, uh, and I and I and I'm going to say that the college, our college team, definitely fell into this because we. I mean, Robin and I ran together a lot, and yes. we ran with a group of of women. You know, college girls, women, and you be you develop in a running intimacy where you can really talk about a lot of things that you wouldn't just talk about. You know, in in, in other places. You know, you really do become intimate. You can talk about the personal stuff, like you were saying about the bodily function but you also end up talking about relationships and you know my running partner now and I we talk about our marriages and we vent and you know talk about life in general and about you know just dealing with the you know the, our town and just we we just really have a a nice back and forth like you're saying Holly so Robin would you agree with that about Ab- the interest? absolutely and I think that that's one of the things that you know I love running about love about running with a partner versus alone. Um, I like it so much better. It's just that, that conversation, sometimes it's the only time that you get to have a, you know, just a real conversation where you don't have any other pull, like nobody else needs anything from you at that time that you get to, you know, just kind of have some space. And I think that that mental thing, particularly for, for women where so much of your day, whether it's your job or your family, you know, there's always these other things that are pulling on you. And when you can get out the door and have a run, that might be your only 30 minutes, 40 minutes, hour, whatever it happens to be that you don't have some of that. And yeah. particularly if you can share that with, you know, a running partner, you then you can kind of all, all that stuff that you don't get to do normally. Well, and Jill, I know you and I had talked about this, but I'd love to hear both of your girls' opinions, you know, as mothers, how do you find it, it's harder to make time to go running, to get on the trail? Um, yes. <laughs> yes, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, when you in when your kids are little, it, it is. I mean, when they're really little, it's it's very challenging because not only do you have to figure out how to bring them with you. I mean, meaning if you want to go, you know, when you're just home with them, um, but you also have to figure out how to fit it in between their needs because young kids are constantly I feel like they're constantly needing something, <laughs> and so that's the tr- that's what I felt was hard. And, you know, it gets easier as they get older. Uh, especially once that you can stick them into one of those running strollers. And I did use a jogging stroller and I even had one I could convert to, to fit both kids in. Um, and although once they got too, they got too heavy to push after a while and I, you know, but, um, I would, you know, you can put them in there and you can give them, um, books and bags of, you know, Cheerios <laughs> and usually can get about 30, almost 30 minutes out of that. Um, I, th- I think it definitely is difficult to squeeze it in, and I found it different at different point. My daughter's, you know, she's 12 now, but we're almost 12, and, um, you know, I found it different when she was a toddler versus when she was, you know, first in school, you know, like where those minutes could come from, and also, you know, just how to fit it in around what else is going on in your family, whether it's, you know, your kids' activities or, you know, all of those things. It, it kind of shifted over time where I could gain the, that time from so and you've been working full-time all along so you know that I mean so you were 
you're balancing a full time job with you know with being you know having being a mom and a you know and a wife and yeah so that's so fitting running in is, yeah it's it is a challenge um, but you managed Robin among amongst all of that you managed to train for two marathons and a half so maybe you could tell us a little bit about a little bit about the training but also about the race because I know one of your races was an all women's marathon so we'd love to hear about that yeah um you know the first marathon I did I trained on my own and that that was okay you know I'd have other people to run with occasionally for shorter runs but my longer runs were done by myself and you know Ben would go out in the car and you know meet me at different stops along the way with water and and whatnot and so that you know, that went okay. For my, the second marathon, I actually trained with a group. I trained with um, team and training for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society um, to run Nike Women's. And that I really liked because it gave me, at least once a week, it gave me a group group of people to run with. And, you know, you get some of that camaraderie. Um, you know, you get to hear everybody's story about why they're involved and give you a little bit of motivation on that. And, um, which I liked. And that was a nice Saturday ritual because that's when I would meet my group. Um, and then the marathon itself was was really cool just because, you know, you're surrounded by thousands and thousands of women all, all in this one race, which I had never run an all-women's race before. So plus, you know, it is a flagship kind of race for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So so many people there were, you know, running with their, you know, who their person was that they were, you know, running in honor of. So it was a very kind of moving experience in that way. But it was just kind of neat to all along the course just the number of signs that were like go mom we're so proud of you know because it was really all focused on on women runners which was just kind of an interesting experience and robin and jill did you girls run while you were pregnant either of you i did the first part of my pregnancy not all the way to the end i don't know jill i think i think it was around like five or six months that i stopped right and same for me i i did run with the first pregnancy i ran up until about like about five to six months. And, and I think people can go further than that. But I started to feel, uh, I remember my very last run because I was up in Vermont for like a ski weekend, although I wasn't, I couldn't, I didn't want to downhill ski at that point. So I was, I went for a run. So it was like January <laughs> and I felt funky, you know, just in that you just feel like something, it's not even feeling heavy or off balance or anything like that. I mean, because you are, you know, you do, you have, you do way more and you have a different shape, but it was more sort of this feeling like something doesn't feel quite right in this, you know, and I'm going to, it doesn't running, it almost feels like it's too jarring, you know, it was kind of, so I kind of said, okay, I'm going to take that as my cue and I'm going to keep, I actually swam, uh, did my swimming for fitness all the way until the day before I delivered. (laughs) So I swam in the pool until, you know, right up until the last possible day that I could. And I went into labor, I think, that night. But I didn't run past, all the way through, you know, and I, I walked. And I, I know that some people make it pretty far. And, in fact, I think my mom, who was part of that 1970s running boom, she was, she and my dad started running in the 70s, and they were sort of part of that group that was inspired by, you know, the, the guys, the local guys. Well, uh, Bill Rogers is a local guy here. But they started running. And so when my mom was pregnant with my younger sister, her last pregnancy, she ran until almost eight months. And wow. in 1976, that was crazy. And the quick, well, I have to tell you. People were singing while yeah. telling her she was going to kill you. <laughs> well, I have to tell you the story that, you know, so it's 1976, and the woman is just about eight months pregnant, and she's running at the YMCA in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, around a tiny indoor track, because that's where her and my dad and my mom started running, so they sort of, they belonged to the Y, and they started, let, let. If this is a tiny track, <laughs> and but they were running, and she was running at this pregnant stage, and she said, she would there would be men because it was still mostly men running again again and being a pregnant woman she really stood out and they were just would stand on the side while she went by with their jaws dropped open like what is this crazy person doing she's going to give birth right here on the track (laughs) (laughs) that's that's pretty fabulous I mean nowadays you know they say like do what you're used to and you can do it and all this sort of stuff. But it does, it does, it does definitely depend on 
you know, because your body changes. You know, I, I got my pre and postnatal cert when I was training, and your body just changes so much. You know, your your hips are shifted differently, your knees are working differently. You've got all the relaxing in your joints, and so stuff is wobbling like it wasn't once wobbling. Mm-hmm. And I, I could see, like, on one hand, like, you know, the hope is, is you know, if I ever did, you know, get pregnant or go for it, that I would keep running but you just you can't you can't predict what your body's going to be like I, I would I don't know I would always caution people you know talk to your doctor every step of the way and just listen to your body yeah, yeah. I don't and know I, I oh, but, good advice <laughs> so I was wondering I mean I don't know if there are any sort of fads that you guys obviously for me I uh I have you know been in and out of the barefoot movement and, uh, and I don't know if there are any fads that you guys have heard of lately that have sort of sprung out of. I think with so many people running, it's like they're making so many different kinds of running shoes. You know, up until a few years ago, Brooks was doing, uh, Brooks was doing, you know, super corrective. And then you have like New Balance doing sort of a wider base and like a thicker, you know, a sort of a wider inside. You've got Mizuno for a narrower foot, all this sort of stuff. And everybody's making different shoes. And now, of course, the latest thing has been this barefoot running movement where you actually see people like running barefoot just out on I don't know if you did you see this in either of your marathons Robin like I did you see I didn't that? notice any, I didn't notice anybody barefoot and I I mean I, I think the barefoot one always kind of strikes me a little you know I, I just couldn't imagine I mean I like to run barefoot on grass but I can't imagine running you know barefoot for a long ways I don't think my feet would take it to be honest I, I like cushion. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have worn, I wear the, the shoes, you know, the, the yeah. five finger shoes, and I like them. But when I see people running just straight up barefoot, I'm like, especially in a city like when Boston, like in the Boston yeah. Marathon, there were definitely people around us who were like gearing up all barefoot. And you're like, dude, this is a city. Yeah. Kids are drinking on the side of the road while we are running past them you know, out of glass bottles. <laughs> Do you really think this is wise? Yeah. <laughs> so know. they were going to attempt the 26.2 miles barefoot. Correct. And I know there have been some people who finish. You know, of course, there's the great Ryan Hall quote, like, when someone wins Boston barefoot, I'll give it a try. And yeah. that hasn't happened yet, as we know. But I, I just, I find it, I like the barefoot movement. My husband and I both dabbled in it to a certain extent. It's been good for the natural stride thing. I probably I roll my ankle a lot less on barefoot shoes because there's no platform to fall off of. But you know, I just I just as like a I don't know. I think that's taking it a bit far. <laughs> I think in this day and age, maybe we have some stuff to dodge. But I don't know. I think well, shoes were probably invented for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I I love the idea of getting back to the natural the natural footfall and the natural gait and all but the barefoot i mean if we were if we were our bodies were designed to run barefoot you know we were pavement was this was you know pavement hadn't been invented yet <laughs> the human body was came about before the paved road so i just think that you know it would work if like like robin said like running on the beach or running on grass where it's a soft landing and you're, you know, it, that makes sense. I can't imagine that people are running barefoot so much on, you know, on, on the roads. I mean, but I think that I'm, I've always run in the, bro- I, not always, but I've most recently been running in a stable stability shoe and I'm ready to, I think I'm ready to break out of that. I'm going to try something a little less. I don't know if I'm going to go to get a five year, what do you call them? The five finger ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if I'll go that far, but I'm going to take a step back and see what it feels like to run something a little bit less structured. <laughs> so, I don't know, Robin. Do you have any any new fad that you've tried in shoes or or gear that you want to discuss? No, I I'm not a I'm not necessarily a fancy gear girl, and you know I like. I like sneakers, but I, I'm I'm kind of a stickler for ones that feel good. And I, you know, I ran in the same kind of brand for a long, long time, and then switched it out a few years ago. But I think one of the things that's been helpful to me is to find a good uh, a good running store, actually, mm-hmm. and find somebody that can really fit shoes. Yeah. To me, that's been particularly as I've gotten older, and you know, my feet have less cushion than they did when I was younger, and all of that, you know, all of the other stuff that comes with aging after so many years of pounding pavement is just uh, finding somebody that can fit a shoe properly to my foot. So, And one of the things, Holly, that, you know, we talked about running on a couple of shows, but 
I am, um, if, if when I have my preference, like if, especially if I'm running alone and I just can go wherever that I want to go, I tend to go in the woods or on the grass. And and I'm wearing wearing shoes, <laughs> but but uh, but I'd be happy to kick them off once if I got on a nice field and just run. But um, I would rather get off the roads entirely and just give. And I think I don't know if this is like um, you know, like a placebo effect, you know, kind of thing, meaning like a just a mental thing in my own head or not. But I my legs, my hips, and knees feel better when I go for a five mile run on the grass. Uh, or the or the woods paths versus running on the roads, and I particularly stay away from sidewalks because in most cities the sidewalks are concrete and the roads are asphalt, and asphalt has a lot more give than concrete. Like there's a difference in the give. So if you ever have a choice between the sidewalk, the concrete sidewalk versus a road, I mean if it's if it's not dangerous to be on the road, then choose the road. I like that. I think that's, I mean, a lot of people do, a lot of people prefer to run on the road. And that's one of the benefits, I guess, of running with a club is people can see you, you know, as when you, when you're on the, when you're alone running on the road, you know, it's, it's less safe than it would be if you had like a lot of people. I don't know why. It just always, you feel sort of protected when you're in a group. I, I, I've just always felt that way. Maybe it's just me. Yeah. Well, I want to, I, I know we want to do a little good, bad, and indifferent about um, running things, but be, I thought before we sort of got to that point that, that maybe you want to talk, um, Holly, about your your race that you're doing this weekend, um, and, you know, we could talk a little bit about that type of relay race. Absolutely. Um, this weekend, I'm running the Reach the Beach Relay, and this is, there are several different kinds of these sort of relays. It's a 200-mile race. Typically, you have a team of about 12 people, so it's two bands, and you basically just relay through the through the course. So the legs are all different lengths. You have some lengths that may do like 3 miles, 13 miles, 7 miles, or 2 miles, 12 miles, 4 miles. And the longest legs are typically around, tw- or not legs, but the longest total distance is typically around like 20 something miles, but you do it seven or three or five at a time. And, uh, and it's, it's a fun event. We did it last year. And I have to say, I think what's interesting is I ran Boston with my husband in 2010. You know, we've, I've, we've done marathons, done halves, done tries, half irons, all that sort of stuff. But what makes this race tough is all the stopping and starting. You, you've done one of these before, right, Jill? I have. I did the version. Um, I guess the original kind of relay was the Hood to Co- Mount Hood to Coast in Oregon, yeah. right? And then, but I and I didn't do Hood to Coast. I did um, Mount Rainier to the Sea, <laughs> or Mount Rainier to the Pacific. So it was it was a similar like that you're going to do this week and reach the beach. And so it is. You're 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 going through the night. So it's a it's a 24 hour race, right? Yes. Yeah. So you start on like you start at like nine a.m. I always tell people it's forty eight, but I always get that wrong. You start at like nine a.m. on Saturday, and then whenever you finish the two hundred miles, you finish. <laughs> I, oh wow! So right, whenever you finish, you finish. <laughs> yeah. So that's. I mean, it's interesting. But did you find the same thing that it was almost like harder than a marathon because of all the stopping and starting? Well, I haven't done a full marathon, so I can't say I've done a half marathon. I I actually felt that. For me, a half marathon or a full marathon would be harder for me because <laughs> because I just you know my I, my body is not necessarily built for that kind of distance. So the relay was nice because I ran a six mile leg and a you know a four mile leg. You know I was doing I wasn't doing the long long legs so um, of the of the relay. So I actually um, I enjoyed it very much. And so maybe that's more my <laughs> maybe that's better for me that kind of relay race. I think, well, if those of you who are interested in this sort of thing and want to know what it's all about, BaseNet uh, is actually covering the race. They're going to come out and shoot the finish and be there with me as I come across the line. I'm going to be tweeting about it this week and updating, hopefully updating through our At Crash and Glass podcast. So by the time this comes out this Friday, I'll be on the road and you guys can get some tweets from me. And uh, I'll be taking some pictures of how smelly we all get in the van and all that exciting <laughs> stuff, maybe some video. So look forward to 
going on BaseNet for coverage. BaseNet will be retweeting some stuff as well as at Crashing Glass. Or you can follow me at Wear It Bright. Those are the, the I am a gear whore, unlike uh, <laughs> yeah. unlike us this week, unlike Robin. So uh, so you can follow me at Wear It Bright, the all one word, at on Twitter, it. and uh, get some updates. And please, uh, you know, if you're while you're on BaseNet, if you want to donate to our programming, feel free to give dollar here, ten dollars there, and you can be a producer of the show. And to throw out a little bit more for resources, that we mentioned the Couch to 5K movement, um, which is, it's actually a, you know, it, ha- it I think it's like almost now like a copyrighted running plan um, from coolrunning.com. So if you are interested in looking up a training plan for running a 5K, if you've never run before or have done very little running, you can go to www.coolrunning, one word, it's just cool, C-O-O-L, coolrunning.com and you can click right on their couch to 5k pro- training or running plan and and another one is um another one i found is fleetfeetsports.com so again www.fleetfeetsports.com and they have training programs as well so you know so i kind of like talking about the whole spectrum like from People for women who maybe have really never run. I mean, I have women, even though there's so many more women running now, I still have women say to me all the time, they, if they know I'm a runner, and I'm really a lifelong runner, you know, at this point, and, and I, even though I'm not doing a ton of mileage now, but, you know, I'm still doing some, and they'll say, I just can't run. You know, I can't run. And, and I just smile because it's, sometimes I don't say anything because I think to myself, I know it's it's damn hard. <laughs> Running is hard, and sometimes I say that I say, you know, you'd be surprised if you just set your goals on one mile, you know, and and then after you do one mile, try to run two miles, you know. But but um, so some people, you know, they just they don't their bodies they feel that it doesn't agree with them, and I don't know if that's because they're not used to that feeling of like hitting like that oxygen debt kind of uh, dis- I call it discomfort because in my world whenever I go for a real run a hard run I'm in dis- I'm uncomfortable the entire time <laughs> but but I'm used to that I know that that's just the way it is but people who have never really done anything like a hardcore sport endurance sport they don't realize that that's just how it feels and that it doesn't mean their bodies can't run it just means that you have to work your way into it. So anyway, a couple websites for beginning runners. And then, you know, it's nice to also talk a little bit more about the specifics and and the gear and the shoes for people who have been running for a while. So I like that we're covering the whole spectrum. Well, and speaking of covering the whole spectrum, ooh, stuttering, speaking of covering the whole spectrum, uh, let's do a little good, bad, and different. And uh, feel free to get creative with these. They don't have to necessarily... They can uh, be basically anything you guys want them to be. I'm excited to return to our recurring segment this week. And Jill, did you have something in mind to kick things off? I do. I have a controversial one that I'll that I'll throw out to the two of you, <laughs> and I need to weigh in on it too. So my first for good, bad, and indifferent, Robin, you just well, Holly, you'll go first since you get we'll get the idea. But my first topic or item is running skirts. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Holly, running skirts, good, bad, or indifferent? Oh, you know what? Oh, this one's tough. Or I should say running in a skirt. <laughs> yeah, right? I know. I, the worst part is I have owned one, but I am tempted to say bad. Mm. And here's why. If if it's honestly more comfortable and less chafy, like if you if that can work and and you still feel comfortable in it, then great, do it. But otherwise, I feel like I understand that looking cute while running is important. Obviously, I'm sort of the poster child for that. I'm very into it. But it just it skirts, man. It's just I feel almost like it's like oppression in a dress. But it's weird because like when I wear a skirt when it's hot outside. And I'm not running. I'm more comfortable. So I, I'm on the fence here. I'm going to go with indifferent because I just can't make up my mind. I okay. want to go with bad, but I just can't because if it's more comfortable, then it's good. That's true. That's true. Okay, Robin. Now, it's so funny. I remember having this conversation with you actually a few years ago. I think the first time um, you know, we had seen somebody in a running skirt. And I, I actually remember you know, when I 
ran a half, my half marathon determined that nobody in a skirt was going to be faster than I was. <laughs> like that was, it just wasn't going to happen. So at that point I thought bad. I actually own a running skirt and I, it was, I, it was a little bit freeing, I have to say, when I finally broke down and, and got one. And I, I actually, I, I like it, I think, because no chafing, nothing quite riding up, you know, which is sometimes the issue with shorts is actually quite comfortable. So I've changed my tune a little bit. I have to say I've been humbled. <laughs> okay. No, that's good. It's good. That's a good learning curve. Um, and I'll just, you know, I didn't, I hadn't, chafing hadn't um, entered my mind about them, not because I've never, you know, it's never happened to me, but I just, I don't, it's not a, it's not a big problem for me. So I think the thing about running in a skirt for me is just, it, it's just, for me, it feels wrong. <laughs> and I love wearing skirts, but I can't wear them running. So, but that's my individual, you know, thing, and and I have I have actually broken down and bought a tennis skirt, and which was hard enough. And even though you're supposed to wear tennis skirts to play tennis, um, according to tradition, so I did wear a tennis skirt recently and felt a little ridiculous at first. But but again, it's kind of you're not you're you're it's just part of the dress code. Um, but a running skirt, I can't do, and um, but it, you know, but I understand why people do. So I'll say that I'm. For me, it's bad, but overall, I'll try to be indifferent. <laughs> I'll try not to judge. <laughs> I have to say, it is still important to me to look tough in my running skirt, though, when oh, I'm yeah. when I'm running. So, and okay. that's the hard part, I would say. <laughs> so, you what do you, you, do you have a good, bad, or indifferent for us, Robin? A topic? Or it can be a topic. It can be a person. Sometimes that's probably the cattiest we ever get on the show. So occasionally <laughs> we'll discuss whether or not we think an actual celebrity is good, bad, or indifferent. I don't think I have one at the moment. I've got to give it some thought. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'll go, I'll go with this one since we're, since we're all runners here. The biggest loser completing a marathon every season, like all of the contestants at whatever weight they're at at the time of the marathon – completing 26.2 miles. Wow. Good, bad, or indifferent? What do you think, girls? Um, I think, well, I don't, you know, I don't watch the show um, really at, hardly at all. I mean, I've seen a little bit. But I would say that, I mean, they're allowed to walk. Is that right? During their, they can run, walk it? Yes, they can. Okay. So I say good. I mean, I mean, I, I'm assuming that if they were at a weight that would really affect their, their knees or their joints, that then the doctors that are associated with the show would say, You're not, you, this, not, this is not a good idea for you health-wise. But So taking that one caveat, I would say it's good. I think that like running that kind of distance and, and making your body push through something like that, I, that, I would say that can only help them. Right. Well, Yes. I have to say I'm with I'm with you, Jill. I you know as long as they're safe about their training and their doctors are you know at a place where they think it's okay, then go for it. I mean that's I I, I actually my original instinct was sort of oh the joint damage and all this sort of stuff, but then I began to read a lot of research and pretty much all of the research points to that when you're dealing with obesity. The, the joint damage that you incur getting in shape very quickly and also, you know, getting in shape very quickly has other drawbacks, but none of them are as detrimental to your health as carrying around that extra 200 pounds for another week, two weeks, months, two years, sure. however it grows into. And so after I read the research on it, I was actually very much for it. I was like, you know what? The, the more extreme, the better, because what people don't realize is that there are very, very few things, actually the top five out of six things we end up spending money on uh, for healthcare late in life and also five out of the six things that people that, that are terminal for us in this country are obesity related. So you're literally talking life and death and that really changed my mind on it. That really made me go all good. Yeah. So that was, it. yeah. So I, I just thought of another uh, another good topic, which is, and, and we've already touched on this when Robin talked about her marathon, which is all women races. Um, what do you girls think for all women races, good, bad, and different? Holly? I did I did the an all women try uh, in, uh, oh gosh, it's been two years ago now, but I think it was like the Disney try or something. But it was a good experience, and I actually liked it because 
they broke the categories up so well that I was really close to age grouping my category. And I'm not a particularly fast triathlete because I uh, am pretty klutzy on a bike, quite frankly. And uh, and I I did really well. And I remember thinking that a part of it was the camaraderie, but another part of it is it's so attainable. You know, I, you always do that thing Robin was talking about, like you get a little competitive when you run and you're always looking at the person in front of you and you're like, well, that chick's wearing all pink. There's no way I'm going to let her take me. And so like, you get, you get a little competitive, but when there are more girls on the course, it almost feels more, I don't, I don't know if this is fair to say, I don't know if this is sexist, but like it almost feels more possible to do well. And so then I just thrived in that environment. And I think it's supportive as well as being kind of fun. And I've done a number of them, but what really, there is one thing that happens at those races that really rubs me the wrong way. And when, when I did the, you guys did the, have, have either of you done the run in Boston, the 10 K women's run? That's like one of the largest in the country. Oh, the Tufts 10 K. Yeah. Yes. I did, it, I did it one time. Yes. Okay, there was this announcer, uh, I did it, I can't remember if it was 2009, somewhere around there, 2008, 2009, who kept saying over and over again, who says women can't run Boston? And I was like, nobody said that in 25, 30 years. Get over yourself. Like, what are you talking about? That's just garbage. It's just nonsense. And I hate it when women get into this. Like, we're not underprivileged in sports anymore. We can play any sport we want. We can do anything we want to. Although, as we talked about, there are still struggles in some areas, like, say, football. But, you know, as far as races are concerned, I think we're all in agreement women can do pretty much any race. So that that annoys me a little bit. I don't like that attitude about it because some women think about it as being separationalist so that they can – so they – I don't know. Some women find it safer, and I just say dive right into the pool. I mean, I like them because of the camaraderie. I think they're fun, but I don't like the attitude that comes with them that, hey, women need their own race. You know? It's kind of like – I don't know. What do you um, think? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I agree. I, I, I thought the thing that I liked about it was the camaraderie and it was just, it was like, wow, look at all these women together running. Like it just, I, I don't know, to me that, that was just a really cool thing. Um, as somebody who, you know, has been a runner, you know, since you're a teenager, but, um, I don't, I didn't feel like I needed a separate race. I just thought it was kind of cool to be in the moment, you know, to be surrounded by a field of, of of women so yeah i i I haven't i guess i did do that top 10k which was some several years ago but i haven't there's an all women triathlon in mass in every summer here in the boston area and i I haven't done that one just because i think it fills up so quickly because i think it does attract women that wouldn't want to do a co-ed race because they've never done a try before so in that way, I think it's good. I mean, I personally write, like running a mixed race just because it's just nice to be among, you know, men and women running. Um, but I think that for the women's movement, this running movement that we're talking about, I think all women's races can really work for some people. And it, and it gives them that extra stimulus to, you know, to try a race or to try a, to try, a try <laughs> for the first time. So I think it's great. You know, I found another quick link that I want to say before we wrap up today, which is there's a little bit about minimalist running. So, you know, with the barefoot idea or the or getting rid of some of the, you know, lots of the cushion and the, that we've been talking about with our shoes. So this is um, runningtimes.com. So if you go to runningtimes.com, they have uh, all sorts of different topics on there, but one of them is minimalism. So if you want to like, read about that, I thought that'd be another neat resource for our listeners. You're the, you're the best about that, Jill. You're always so good at finding us the best resources and the best place to go for, <laughs> for more info after the show. And obviously for more info after the show, you can go to basenettv.com and find the at Crashing Glass tab. You can talk to Jill and I. Hey, if you have more questions for Robin, please send them in. We would love to hear from you. And uh, I guess thank you so much for joining us, Robin. Do you have anything else you want to share with our listeners? No, thanks for including me today. <laughs> this was fun. Awesome. Well, guys, we have enjoyed spending time with you for another Crashing Glass podcast. Have a great week. Get on the road. Go run. (laughs) Bye.